All right, good morning. Uh, my name is Cam. I'm one of the pastors here at Grant, and we're so glad that you have joined us today. Uh, now, how many people have already been glued to their screens uh, for the Olympic Games? Any? We have a few people, right? Some, I know some people who move their TV from the basement up to the kitchen so they don't miss anything, right? We got our first medal yesterday already, right? Go Canada. Way to go. All right. <laughs> We're so not nationalistic like that, are we? Uh, it's funny, isn't it, how once every four years we all become avid fans of things like hammer throw, fencing, and the 42-kilometer marathon. Right? I don't even know the rules of most of these things, but boy, do I love watching, and boy, am I an expert when, they start, when the judges start making their decisions, right? Now, speaking of marathons, uh, today we reach the 50th message in our study in the Old Testament book of Genesis. Uh, yeah, right? That's, that clap is for all of us. Um, and this morning we find ourselves amidst that study still journeying with Jacob, the one chosen to carry the promises of God originally given to his grandfather Abraham. And so I invite you to turn with me in your copy of the scriptures to Genesis chapter 32 uh, as we continue to unpack God's work in the life of one who is far from perfect but who has been chosen by God for his good purposes. And so today we're reading from Genesis 32 starting at verse 1. Jacob also went on his way and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is the camp of God. So he named that place Mahanim. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, this, the country of Edom. He instructed them, this is what you are to say to my Lord Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, male and female servants. Now I am sending this message to my Lord that I may find favor in your eyes. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, we went to your brother Esau and now he's coming to meet you and 400 men are with him. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and herds and camels as well. He thought if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. He spent the night there, and from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows and 10 bulls, and 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. He put them in the care of his servants, each herd by itself, and said to his servants, go ahead of me and keep some space between the herds. He instructed the one in the lead, when my brother Esau meets you and asks, where do you belong to and where are you going and who owns all these animals in front of you, then you are to say they belong to your servant Jacob. They are, they are a gift sent to my Lord Esau, and he is coming behind us. He also instructed the second and the third and all the others who followed the herds. You are to say the same thing to Esau when you meet him. And be sure to say your servant Jacob is coming behind us. For he thought, I will pacify him with the gifts I am sending on ahead. Later, when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. So Jacob gift, Jacob's gifts went on ahead of him. 
but he himself spent the night in the camp. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray today that as we dig into it, Lord, that you would uh, change us as a result of what we encounter uh, from the scriptures this morning. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there's a lot going on in this text, but uh, we can essentially, I think, break it down into three sections, right? And so first, we have an angelic visit. Next, we have a looming conflict. And finally, we have a surprising response or the account of how Jacob reacts to the looming conflict in light of the angelic visit. So let's begin our exploration of the text with the angelic visit at the top. Verse 1. Jacob also went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is the camp of God. So he named that place Mahanaim. Okay, so in our text last week, Jacob had just entered into a covenant with his father-in-law Laban that they would head in opposite directions and refrain from harming one another, right? In a sense, they permanently ended their relationship as Laban headed back 500 kilometers north to Haran and Jacob pressed on south towards Canaan. Well, at some point along the journey, as he headed south, verse 1 says, the angels of God met Jacob. Now, what or who are these angels of God? Well, if you remember about six or seven weeks ago, for those who have been following, when Jacob was originally running to Haran from Canaan 20 years earlier, God gave Jacob a vision in a dream about the angels of God ascending and descending on a giant staircase. Do you remember that? And what Jacob took from that vision 20 years ago was that there is another realm. There is a spiritual realm that interacts with the earth. And at the end of this dream, God himself spoke to Jacob saying in Genesis 28, 13, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. All right, so God made this covenant promise to Jacob 20 years ago while showing him that he has the power to protect and do what he promises because he works in the world that he has created. And so here, 20 years later, as he's heading back to Canaan, like God had promised he would, these same angels of God appear to Jacob as a seal or a reminder of the promise made 20 years earlier. Now, we don't know exactly what Jacob saw, but the language here that they met him is a word used for how one nation's army would meet another, right? And it suggests that he likely saw some sort of legion or army of angels, leading him to declare in verse 2, this is the camp of God. Right? God, in this moment, reminds Jacob, as he's about to re-enter the promised land, that he is not alone, and God will keep his promise to protect him, and that he, he has the means to do so with a glimpse of the he heavenly armies. Well, Jacob, in response to what he sees... Verse 2 says, names the place Mahanim, which literally means two camps, right? He names this place, it, and it means two camps. You see, Jacob is declaring that his camp, right, his people are not alone, that there is another reality, another camp with them, the camp of the armies of God, now, you would think that knowing this would dispel any sort of fear for Jacob, right? As he heads into Canaan, that the armies of God that are with him would give him confidence. But as fear does, 
It continues to get the best of Jacob, even if he can reason that God is with him and will protect him, right? Isn't that the case with all of us? We know that God is with us, yet we still feel alone. Or we know God is in control, yet we clamor for control ourselves. Or we know nothing can thwart the will of God, yet we fear that certain things are out of his hands. Right? Sometimes knowing a spiritual truth doesn't translate very well to the way we respond. And we see that at least at first with Jacob. And this leads us to the second section of our passage, the looming conflict. Have you ever overcome something just to realize that there's an even greater obstacle up ahead? Right? We see this in movies all the time, right? They fight some big, you know, enemy and then they turn around and they're exhausted and they're celebrating and they turn and there's an even bigger enemy waiting there, right? Maybe for you, you left everything out on the field or the rink or the diamond and against all odds, you pull off a victory for the ages only to realize that that win just bought your team a date with the best team in the league. Or maybe you're on a hike and the steep climb that took everything out of you and you thought would get you to the top of the mountain turns out to be a warm-up for the real climb up ahead. Well, just as Jacob lets out a massive exhale with the resolution of the Laban conflict, that God had protected him from Laban, that he's actually going home, the reality sets in that he is actually going home. And there are implications to this, not the least of which he will need to see his brother Esau. Now, for those just joining us or who maybe missed the past couple of months, one of the main reasons Jacob was in Mesopotamia to begin with was because he had run away from his brother's wrath. Right? Over 20 years earlier, Jacob had deceived their father into giving him the firstborn's blessing that belonged to the eldest Esau. And the last Jacob knew before he fled was that Esau had vowed to kill him for what he did, right? Hence the running away. And as he has barely experienced his newfound freedom of life without Laban, the reality sets in that he may not be given a hero's welcome upon his return. In fact, Esau may still be seeking to end his life. There may just be a greater obstacle ahead than the one behind him. And so Jacob decides that he should give Esau a heads up, right? And not just appear on the doorstep, you know, to avoid a violent snap reaction, and perhaps to get a sense of the climate that he's coming back into. And so he does, as we all do before we travel to see family, he sends an email to start the conversation. Tells Esau of his plans. Hey, I'm coming out your way. Any chance we could stay with you? Well, it's not actually an email. Computers were still a few years off at this point. But the ancient Mesopotamian uh, equivalent of a heads-up email was to send a messenger not Facebook Messenger, remember, no computers, but a real-life messenger, humans, to deliver a message. Verse 3 to 5. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He instructed them, this is what you are to say to my lord Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, male and female servants, now I'm sending this message to my Lord that I may find favor in your eyes. So in short, Jacob's instructions were, tell my brother that I'm alive, right? It's been 20 years since they last saw each other. Tell him where I have been. I've been with Laban in Haran in Mesopotamia. Tell him I've made something of my life, right? I have many possessions and large flocks, and tell him that I hope we're okay now, right? I hope to find favor in his eyes. Now, notice what is missing. There's no apology here, is there? Now, just two quick thoughts on apologies and forgiveness before we move on. Number one, in regards to apologies, if you have hurt someone or negatively impacted them, apologize. It's a simple rule. 
right? Even if you feel justified in what you have said or done, or it was like 20 years ago, like in this case, if it has left someone wounded, if it has broken relationship, acknowledge it and apologize for the role you have played in their hurt, right? In our text today, it seems like Jacob puts this whole thing on Esau's shoulders, doesn't he? He's essentially saying, I I know you're mad, but can you just get beyond your anger? But he doesn't acknowledge what he did to make Esau mad in the first place. Right, church, an apology is a sign of maturity and a desire for real reconciliation, and it's what the Bible calls us to do. Proverbs 28, 13. Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. Right? Participate in reconciliation by confession, by acknowledging your fault and by asking for forgiveness. Or in short, don't be a Jacob. Now on the other hand, the second thought here is regarding forgiveness. If you, on the other hand, have been hurt by someone or been negatively impacted by them, extend forgiveness whether an apology is made or not. As our text shows us, there will be times when those around you don't apologize. And yet, we are still called to forgive, regardless of the presence or quality of an apology. Right? I, I think our human tendency is to withhold forgiveness until we are sure that the party who, hurts, who hurt us understands completely the implications of their actions, that they show a level of remorse that we find satisfactory, and that they apologize profusely and maybe even live in a probationary period where they need to prove to us how sorry they are by the way they live now. Well, friends, this is an unbiblical, actually anti-biblical understanding of forgiveness. Colossians 3.13 says, If one of you has a complaint against another, forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Ephesians 4.32 agrees, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Do you hear the theme in those two verses? What is the biblical teaching on forgiveness? Forgive as God has forgiven you. And how has God forgiven you? Freely. And generously, with no strings attached. Graciously, unconditionally, and consistently. When Jesus was asked by Peter what the limits to forgiveness were, right? Peter basically said, what's like reasonably generous? Jesus basically replied, forgiveness does not end. Matthew 18, 21 to 22. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Right? He's kind of trying to go, you know, that's reasonable, right? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times, or 70 times seven, which would be 490 times, depending on your translation. But regardless of the number, the message is the same. Jesus says you won't reach the number of trespasses that you would be given the green light not to forgive. Now, we could go on, right? Forgiveness is a major topic in the scriptures, but you get the point. There are no checklists or prerequisites that must be completed in order for our calling to be to forgive. Church, we will have people like Jacob in our lives who don't grovel the way that we would like, or acknowledge the hurt to the extent we find appropriate, or who even avoid mentioning their folly at all. But biblical forgiveness does not depend on them and the process they should go through. Biblical forgiveness depends on you and the process you are going through as Christ sanctifies you and leads you to act like Jesus. Now, there is an entire series to be preached with all sorts of nuance on this very topic of forgiveness, and maybe one day 
we will. But for now, the simple challenge is if you have hurt someone, take responsibility and apologize for what you have done. And if you have been hurt by someone, take initiative. Don't wait to extend forgiveness expecting a perfect apology because the one that you have crafted in your mind that would be acceptable likely will never come. And you are the one who won't be able to move on in the freedom that comes from forgiving like Christ. Now, for those who are currently struggling with this, with forgiveness, and I know this is a much bigger conversation than a few minutes on a Sunday morning. If you would like to explore this further, the biblical teaching on forgiveness. The very last book that Timothy Keller wrote before he died is a book called Forgive, Why Should I and How Can I? It's published just last year and in my opinion is a great help for those walking the journey of forgiveness. I know that we have a copy in our library, um, but there's more than one of us here. Uh, I also have a few copies that I'd be happy to lend out as well. But that's one resource uh, that I would recommend for those who want to dig deeper theologically and practically in regards to forgiveness. But for this morning, it's time that we get back to our text. Uh, Jacob sends the messengers ahead with these words, as feeble as they may be, and waits for a response. And when his messengers come back, there's good news and bad news. The good news is that they come back alive, right? It's pretty good news, knowing some of the practices in the ancient Near East. It wouldn't have been a great sign if Esau had simply sent back their heads, right? Or something like that, or if they didn't return at all. But here they come alive and in one piece. It's a good start. However, the message they bring is vague and a little bit ominous, Verse 6, when the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, we went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you. Oh, and uh, 400 men are with him. <laughs> okay, so that may not be such great news. Right? If, if Jacob would have been toppled by Laban and some of his relatives, as we read last week, imagine what Esau's 400 fighting men might do. And this is exactly Jacob's line of thinking. Verse 7. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and herds and camels as well. He thought if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. And immediately, moved by fear, rather than the confidence he should have had, Jacob moves to the worst-case scenario thinking that Esau will attack and wipe them out. And so he devises what I think is a relatively questionable plan that perhaps came to him as he pondered the name that he gave this place, Two Camps. And the idea is I'm going to separate us into two camps. I'm going to create two groups, you know, a couple of wives over there, a couple wives over here, so that only half of them will die. It must sound really reassuring to those traveling with him, right? We've all got a 50% chance of survival here. I can just see some within the two groups, like taking an inventory of who was with them to determine if they were in the favored camp, right? Or maybe the one likely to be set up as a decoy or a sacrificial group, right? If you're like, hey, weird Uncle Harry's in this one. Wait, (laughs) Rachel and Jacob or Rachel and Joseph are in that group? Oh, man. But... Regardless, this is the plan that he devises, right? Well, that and sending a gratuitous amount of livestock to Esau as a gift. Look at verse 13. He spent the night there, and from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows and 10 bulls, and 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. Now, for those of you trying to do the quick math in your head, that is over 550 animals. 550 named plus the young of the camels, and we don't know how many that was. But this is a huge gift, which shows us, first of all, Just how much God has blessed Jacob over the past six years. That he could give away that much out of what he had. And remember, that's only half of the camp now. 
right? He's already split the groups into two. So this is the excess that he has out of half of his camp. God has blessed him incredibly. And it shows either how uh, remorseful Jacob was for what he did to Esau, or probably more likely the level of fear he had in Esau's impending arrival. But regardless, Jacob tells his servants to give this message, to give this massive gift to Esau in three increments in hopes that as we read in verse 20, Esau would be pacified or appeased by the gifts and will receive Jacob kindly as a result. So that is Jacob's plan. He splits the camp in two to minimize losses and he will attempt to mollify Esau through exorbitant gifts. Now, uh, we will see to what extent his plan works in two weeks. But for the rest of our time together, I actually want to draw our attention to, believe it or not, the sanctification happening in Jacob's life as evidenced by this text. And if we look closely, maybe really closely, at this passage, we begin to see some evidence of change in Jacob from the man who we have followed throughout these past few chapters up until now, right? And this is the surprising response that we talked about earlier. And I'm going to point out four things that this text tells us about Jacob's forward progress through two things that he does not do and two things he does do in this situation in the way he responds to this impending threat and these things correspond to one another. So the first thing Jacob doesn't do that proves some growth in his life is he doesn't run. Right? He doesn't run. If you think about it, that's pretty significant for Jacob. Right? In both other scenarios that Jacob has been in danger in the past, his response has been to flee. He's run away from danger. When he heard Esau was going to kill him, he fled to Haran for 20 years. When he decided to leave Haran, he fled without telling anyone, running back to Canaan to escape his father-in-law. Fear has led Jacob to run away in the past. And while we would expect this to be the case here as well, right? it, it wouldn't surprise us to read that he turned around and bolted when he heard of Esau's 400 men coming towards him. But that's not what he does. Now, what does he do instead? And this is the first thing Jacob does do. Jacob obeys, right? He doesn't run, but he does obey. Why doesn't he run away? Because God has told him to go home to the promised land, right? And to run away would be to disobey what God has told him. And so while he fears for his life, which is evident in the text, he decides that disobedience to God would be worse. Uh, Pastor Tim Keller notes, he says, when we obey God's word, even though disobedience would be safer, we are putting ourselves in God's hands and trusting him. When we disobey him in order to be safe, we're actually running into spiritual danger. Sin against God ultimately leads to spiritual, personal, and relational breakdown. In the past, that was what Jacob would have done. He does not do that now. Jacob is starting to understand what following God looks like. And likely, the visit from the angel army helped. But there's growth here as he physically leaves himself in a dangerous situation because this is what God has called him to do. Now, for us, I'm not sure how many of us have or will be called into physically dangerous scenarios by God, although it's not out of the question when you look through, look at Christian obedience throughout the world and throughout the millennia. But that doesn't mean that we won't be called into uncomfortable scenarios or difficult situations or circumstances that are socially detrimental especially as cultural values move further and further away from what God calls us to give our lives to, right? And we need to understand, just as Jacob is starting to, that being safe with our God, being in right relationship with him, being righteous in his eyes, obedience to his word, is far more important than any safety or comfort we can enjoy on this earth. 
As well-known 20th century Bible commentator Warren Wearsby famously said, the safest place in all the world is in the will of God. Or as Psalm 18 says, the Lord is my rock, my fortress and my savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me and my place of safety. Which leads us to the next thing that Jacob doesn't do, that we might have expected him to. He doesn't deceive, which is also surprising, isn't it? For the past few months, as we've followed Jacob's life, the title deceiver has consistently followed him around as recently as last week when Laban called him out for leaving deceptively. And so as we see Jacob come into a situation like this, we might assume, as maybe Esau does, perhaps this is why he brings 400 men, that Jacob is about to manipulate his way through this as well. But he doesn't. And while the gifts he presents may seem like a play to purchase favor, the gifts are actually given legitimately honestly and openly. And as we'll see in a couple of weeks, he insists that the gifts are taken. This is not manipulative. It is not all for show. This is a corner turned for Jacob as he lays down his historically deceptive schemes, instead trusting God to do his bidding, which is the final thing for us to note in Jacob's response to this conflict. Look at verse 9. Then Jacob prayed. Jacob prays. He doesn't deceive, rather he does pray. When faced with a conflict for the very first time that we have recorded, Jacob turns to God for help. And while it isn't the first thing he does, remember he's still learning, once he splits his people into two groups. He went off on his own, it would seem, and he prays to the one who has proven to be with him over and over. Right? What a change in this man, if you think about it. From a deceiver to a man of prayer. Who would have thought? And while we must wait a couple weeks to see how it all turns out, we can be sure that this is a different Jacob than we have read about. This is a different man coming back into Canaan than the one who left 20 years earlier, even if his apology or lack thereof left much to be desired. Well, what I'd like to do for the last uh, few minutes that we have together is to briefly unpack the way that Jacob prays, all right? to see how does this guy who we've never seen come before God in prayer, how does he come before God in prayer? And maybe to serve as a sort of model for us for when we find ourselves in situations where we are, as verse 8 says, in great fear and distress. Well, the first thing Jacob does as he comes before God in prayer is that he comes before him personally. He comes before God in prayer personally. Verse 9. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and to your relatives, and I will make you prosper. Now, some reading that verse may think this actually isn't personal because he doesn't address God as his God, only the God of Abraham and Isaac. But what we need to notice is that he addresses God the very same way God revealed himself to Jacob. Remember that dream we talked about in Genesis 28 with the staircase? Well, God introduced himself to Jacob as the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. This is the title God gave himself. And Jacob here is referring to God the way that God introduced himself to him. And so in doing so... Jacob, in prayer, calls upon the God whom he has met before, right? The one who came to him personally. This is not a, dear God, whoever you are, or God, if you're out there, type of prayer. 
Jacob calls on the God who he is coming to know, the one with whom he has spoken before, the one who had chosen him. Right? This prayer is prayed in the context of relationship, a growing one for sure, but in the context of relationship. It's a continued conversation. And for us, church, when we come before God, we ought to approach God in this way too. Right? We don't need to conjure up God's presence. We can approach God in a personal way. Right? Jesus himself, when he was asked how to pray in Luke 11, taught his disciples to refer to God as Abba, right? the Aramaic word for father. Right? Those who know God don't come to him as a stranger would in hopes that he might just have mercy. Rather, they come towards God as a child comes to their father, confident that their father listens and desires what is best for their children. So Jacob comes before God, continuing a conversation that God himself initiated years ago. And after addressing God, he continues, verse 10, I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I've become two camps. Right? And in this, we see Jacob come before God humbly. Right? He comes personally and he comes humbly. Right? There's a humility about Jacob when he prays. He says that he is unworthy of God's faithfulness. There's a confession here. And as such, he does not demand anything from God. In fact, before he even gets to his request, he admits that without God, he would not and should not be where he is. Before he asks anything, he admits that he has no real right to ask aside from God's faithfulness and mercy in his life. And if God is to do anything, it will be because God is good, not because Jacob deserves it. Well, church, this is absolutely the way that we are to come before God in prayer as well. Often I think we feel, whether we would ever say this or not, like God kind of owes us something. Right? Like our prayers deserve to be answered the way we want because, you know, we've been faithful to God. It's, it's why we say, why me, God, when something goes wrong, but we seldom say, why me, God, when things are going well? But the reality is that God is God and we are not and every prayer needs to begin with that assertion, with that assumption, and the understanding that if God chooses to do anything, it will be because of him and his kindness, not because of us. Well, after establishing that fact that God is a father and that the father really owes the child nothing, Jacob takes the opportunity to make his request. And in this, we see him come before the Lord honestly. Verse 11, save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. Right? Jacob gets right down to it, admitting to God that he is afraid and that he needs God to save him from his brother Esau. Right? He doesn't ask in a roundabout way. He gets right to the point. He shares how he feels and what it is that he's asking for God to do for him. All right? And friends, we can be honest with God as well in prayer. Right? Once we acknowledge, God, you are God, and ultimately you know better than I do, we can tell him whatever it is that we want we can tell him how it is that we are feeling. We can tell him what it is that we're struggling with. And we can tell him how we want him to help. Right? There's nothing off limits when we come before God in prayer. As Philippians 4, 6 tells us, we are to pray about anything and everything. And when we do this, we can, as Jacob does, pray expectantly. We can pray expectantly. Verse 12. But you have said, 
I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. Jacob ends his prayer with a reminder of what God has promised to him. He declares the word of the Lord. Now, I don't think that Jacob is just trying to butter God up here or even use God's own words against him as if to say, you have to save me, you said so. I think that he says this as much to remind himself that the God he's coming to in prayer is the same one who said he would be with him, protect him, and prosper him. Right? It's like putting a period at the end of the sentence by saying, I can be confident in what happens. And this could go a few different ways because God has promised to be with me. And church, we too can pray confidently declaring God's very own word in prayer in expectation that whatever happens, it will be in line with God's character, consistent with his word. It will be for our own good and ultimately for his glory. You see, prayer doesn't need to be that difficult or complicated. When we come before God personally, in context of trusting relationship, humbly acknowledging who we are in light of him, We can share honestly what we need, what we want, what we desire, and we can move forward expectantly with anticipation of what our loving Father will do. Church, may we, like Jacob, though far from perfect, come to God in prayer anytime we may be tempted to take things into our own hands. And may we follow in obedience when we would otherwise be tempted to run knowing that we are not alone. And there is another camp, the camp of God that goes with us into every situation and scenario we may face. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for this story of sanctification, slow yet steady, that you worked in the life of Jacob, changing him and molding him into the likeness of your son. God, and we thank you for this story because it gives us hope that you can and are changing us as well. God, continue to work in us that we may look less like us and more like you each and every day, no matter what obstacles we face or what fears may threaten. Lead us to obedience and draw us into prayer. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.